I'd like to pick up where we were earlier. So let's just kind of refresh where we were. So we started off with DC resistivity. We looked at the basic uh, experiment where you put a current in to uh, into the earth, how that current moves depends upon the resistivity or the conductivity uh, of the earth. And we saw in particular that if we get current that crosses any kind of uh, interface where there's a change in conductivity, but there's going to be charges that are built up. Those charges are then the source of electric potentials that we can measure at the Earth's surface. Then there's a formula for converting those potentials to an apparent resistivity. And the only thing that's really required there is that we know we just know the geometry where all the electrodes are. So that allows us to uh, uh, generate, take data, and transform it into something that's a little bit more realistic, namely apparent resistivity. Because potentials, as we saw, go from being infinite at the uh, current electrode down to something that's really small. So that doesn't help very much. You need to transform it into something that's useful. So we have that uh, particular formula that we use to get apparent resistivities. We saw that if we plot the apparent resistivities uh, just by themselves, if we plot them in a particular way, uh, we have a nice way of having kind of like a data map uh, that's useful for QC and also just for getting a general idea of what that conductivity is. In collecting the data, we had kind of a couple ideas in mind. If the Earth is just 1D, then we could just use a sounding. That means that we take a particular configuration, and we just make it progressively bigger and bigger and bigger, and as we make that larger, we're seeing to greater depths. If we have something horizontally, we don't really know where it is, and we also have to do profiling. So you need to make sure that you've got, like, if I'm trying to find uh, with Ricardo, if I need to have an electrode spacing that's big enough to, to see you, but I might be over here and you're not in my vision, but if I move over here, then gradually I see you and then vice versa. So it's, it's that combination of sounding and profiling then that allows us to see. And uh, for 2D Earth, that's, that's really all we need. Uh, if the Earth is 3D, then things just simply become more complicated I and mean, you just you don't know where things are. You don't know what the geometry is. We also talked about coupling issues. So if you have a plate, then depending upon the orientation of that plate with respect to the primary field, you either get a bigger signal or not. And that strength of signal also depends upon whether you have a conductive plate or a resistive plate. So you know, things are different. The Important thing with respect to survey de design is something called the sensitivity, and that involves two aspects. One is we have to have a current source that can at least excite the body of, of interest, and then once we have that, then we need to decide what measurement we want to want to take and in what orientation. We're going to be coming back to that continuing throughout this whole rest of the course because things are actually going to get more complicated when we go to uh, electromagnetics compared to DC resistivity. So that's kind of where we were before lunch. We introduced a number of apps that you can use. As I said, we'll show you how to access them. Um, and those apps can help to reinforce the basic uh, principles. So I'd like to turn now to a case history. And this is a minerals uh, application case history, but I think you'll still find it very interesting because the geologic consequences are uh, still pretty profound. I mentioned this morning that we're going to capture the case histories in this seven-step procedure uh, where we have, uh, well, ba basically seven steps of uh, deciding what your problem was, your properties, what the surveys are, your data, processing, interpretation, and synthesis. All of what we're going to show you this afternoon is 
is mostly encapsulated in EMGSI, which is our open source resource. And there's an area there called geophysical surveys that's got a number of uh, elements associated outlining both sort of fundamentals of the surveys, seven-step framework, which I just talked about, survey design considerations, and, and forward modeling. So they, and our idea with this open source is that it's a way for you to kind of get an idea of um, basic information that, that you want. If you have like a DC resistivity survey, uh, we'd be able to sign on and look to see what's, you know, what's happening for each survey and in particular for DC resistivity. We have a uniform presentation. So we first of all start with the physics of the problem and then what a typical survey would be, what the data are, what the interpretation might be or how you would get an interpretation and then practical considerations. These are still a, a, a work in progress, I and mean, there's always things that could be added, but for instance, for the DC museum, we've got basically enough stuff there to kind of get you going if you didn't really know very much about what was happening. And then as I said, <laughs> the, um, a major aspect of EMGSI is going to be uh, case histories. We have a number of case histories that span minerals, hydrocarbons, uh, environmental, ge geothermal, and they're all set up in that seven step. So I'm going to take you through, through Mount Isa. Uh, this is a prospect in Australia, and uh, it's a mining project, and it's going to involve DC resistivity. It actually involves DC resistivity and IP. So we're going to start with this case history now for DC resistivity. On Friday, we're going to end all of this material by looking at the same case history, but now with IP, which in our case stands for induced polarization. IP stands for a lot of things. <laughs> so let's just look at the at the setup. So the very first thing is you need to know something about the, the geology. And in this particular case, um, there's a mineralization unit that is someplace in here. We've got volcanic rocks, we've got lots of vert vertical structure, siltstones, sandstones, and we're trying to find a, uh, a, a conductive mineralized body that, that's buried in there. And so that's, re that's really the question. Okay. Can, can we use DC resistivity survey and, and data to identify a conductive target in a bunch of siltstones. Okay, that's that's the goal. So to do that, we first of all need to identify the different units and their physical properties. So in this case, we've got a number of units down here: siltstones, <coughs> shales, volcanics, and the physical property that we're interested in is conductivity. The target region is something called the Mount Nobit horizon, and that's distinguished by having a high conductivity compared to the host volcanic rocks, um, and also it's higher than some of the additional siltstones that's holding it. So that's good news because you want your target to be distinguished from the rest of the background. The fly in the ointment here is that there is a something called a breakaway shale, it's a black shale, that has got a very high conductivity. So that means that even the thing that we're looking for is, you know, it's got a high conductivity compared to most things, but there's another unit in there that has even got a higher conductivity. So that, that's going to complicate things a bit. The surface topography is not extreme, but there is, and it needs to be taken into account. The geology is more or less north-south, so that means that when you think about setting up a survey, uh, you could almost do 2D lines, just crisscrossing, and just measure what's happening and on that a long line and do multiple lines, and that's exactly what's going to happen. 
So the survey is going to be eight lines of data, going like this. So just for your, your reference, this this is about eight kilometers, six kilometers north to south. Of and the data survey that we're going to take uh, from from this morning, you'll now. Uh, this this will seem familiar. First of all, it's a pole dipole. But if you remember what that is, it means a current, just a single current source, and then we're measuring electric potentials this way, and then we're going to kind of move the whole thing. The data are plotted in a pseudo section format, which again we we understand. So the starting value here has got a current here and potentials all the way across, and then. For each potential electrode, we do these 45 degree angles and then it would plot along here. So the location of the first electrode provides all these apparent resistivities and then we gradually move that current electrode farther and farther and farther until we get a final super section. Then we're going to do that at each line and across here at all eight lines. So this gives us eight data maps, and uh, yeah, we can see there's, some, there's something happening. On the color scale here, the red is very conductive, and the blue is, is really, really very resi resistant. One question. Yep. In this space, the experience, as you said, you have okay, different positions, and different positions for the depth by wall, and different positions for the, yeah. The source here, yeah. but you also try different uh, aperture from the dipole as well. No, each uh, you get fix it. Yeah, so it's like we populate this with uh, let's say 32, 32 electrodes, okay. and then we start. Okay, this is going to be the current electrode, and then we're going to measure potential one, two, three, four, five, okay. okay, and then plot that, and then we move over with the current electrodes, do the same thing over the same thing. But the measurements from the potential is always among bit uh, neighbor Navy dipoles. You never do like no. You would it like so because well. to get the top row, right? But then what about getting the next row down, right? You need the wider somewhere. Is that right? No. no. You're just moving the dipole. You're just moving the current. So this, oh, right, so you get, Sorry. yeah, you get the current and then you just have all these potential. So here's your current. So like that. So here's our current. And then here's potential. One, two, three, four, five, right? So this gives you one, Two, three, four. So that gives you this, right? Now you go here, and now you get uh, one. Now you go here. Right? So you kind of end up with this terrible one, but that gives you your that gives you your yeah, okay. The point is, uh, wouldn't it bring uh, valuable information if you also measure the potential with a higher aperture? Uh, in, in fact, not really. It kind of depends a little bit on the signal to noise, but you know, if I take the potential from these two points, if I take this potential and add it to this potential, yeah, it just okay. Then so, uh, now uh, I've got the same as if I had this okay. potential. So you don't get any extra real extra. Energy. Anyway, so that's that's your data. Like you've got ten or eight, no, just ten, ten images of the of, of the data. What's the geology? Well, as we saw this morning, we talk about trying to find Sergio and like which way they is if we change the location of the current and do things the other way around, then things might uh, look different. So this is what they have with a pole dipole. It looks like that. Right? 
But now if we switch things around and do a dipole pole, we actually have quite a different set of images. There's still something very conductive that's, that's going on here. Uh, but it's, it's a different image. So now I've got 20 images. What's the geology? Well, at this point, you just, you know, you have no uh, possibility except to just appeal to inversion, and that's what we're going to do. In this case now, the inversion is exactly the same as what we've done for 2D, except that now we've got 3D. So, so we've got a 3D volume each that's made up of a whole bunch of little cuboidal cells, and then we're going to adjust the values of those so that we reproduce these data maps and uh, have the geology that's reasonable. So this is actually what your what the final result is here, and that is it's a cube of conductivity. It's color color coded according to this axis. So red is conductive, blue is, is resistive. And then what we're going to do is to view this uh, in different ways. We're going to slice it from front to back, and then we're going to slice it from top to bottom. So we'll have First of all, section views, and then plan views, and then we're going to rotate this thing around and look at successive isosurfaces so that in the end, you're just looking at the most conductive target. So you see there is a big conductor on the right-hand side. Conductors are red. Red. Conductors are red. red. Blues are resistant. Yeah. yeah. So there's, in, in this particular case here, so you can see there's big resistor over here. That, those are volcanics. There's resistor over here. There's this big long conductor up here. And there's a little conductor up in there. Those are the, the major elements that you're seeing. And now we'll successively turn this around. And there we are at the end. So if you look at the highly conducting objects in here, we have this great big guy here, might be something up here, and then there's, the, the, there's something. That, that happens up there. So this is your, your, your 3D geology. And if we now look at, okay, what is that uh, telling us and how do we really in, in, interpret it? The big thing that we saw here is this conductor that, that's going. That is actually a breakaway shale unit. So unfortunately, this is one of those circumstances where you go out and you try to find something, but the biggest thing that you find is totally, you know, it's interesting geologically, but it's uninteresting from an economic mineralization viewpoint. But that is what that big tar target is. And there are other things that are useful on here. Remember the uh, Mount Nobit horizon was distinguished by being kind of a moderately high conductivity. And you can see that you know there is something perhaps of interest over <coughs> here. There's perhaps something of interest over here. And maybe there's there, there's something interesting there. The, yeah. Is this a series of uh, 2D inversions that just somehow interpolates? Or this is a real 3D inversion? This is a real 3D inversion, but the data acquisition was yeah, okay. kind of a 2D. And that's okay. I mean, if the if the Earth is more or less two D, but it's it's changing, and if the line spacing is smaller than the you know the resolution or penetration of your uh, data line, then you're actually okay. So one thing about DC resistivity, if I have a line of data, I have a particular sort of depth of investigation. Really, I'm equally sensitive to everything else that's happening yes, at that same depth. So if I have another line that's in between that, then I'm you know, even the offline data are sort of sensing what's what's going on. So inverting in 3D can be very beneficial. 
Um, yeah, so that's that, that's sort of the takeaway message here that it's actually been quite uh, quite useful. We'll see that this is not the end of the story. I'm kind of setting it up because it's really the IP part here that is really interesting, but we won't see that till Friday. What I do want to show you is uh, kind of introduce you a little bit to Ian GSI and to kind of show you what we're attempting to do there and then how this particular case history uh, is visible on EMG assign. So we'll just uh, go to emgsi.xyz and can we make this larger? Uh, yeah. Okay. So this is what you're going to see when you uh, when, when you kind of sign on. Uh, we've got. Here's the GSI logo. And on the left-hand side, there's a number of things. There's apps. So that's our that's going to be your inroad to finding the apps. List of uh, contributors. We talk about there's introduction. We have some information about physical properties. So if you go to physical properties, you know, it'll talk about conductivity, permeability, and electrical permittivity. So some of the things that we talked about really early this morning. There's four sections about Maxwell's equations, everything from fundamentals to the DC to frequency domain to, to, to time domain. We'll explore those a little bit later. The thing that will get us closer to where we want right now is geophysical surveys, which uh, has got both the uh, some fundamentals, and then there's we come to the particular survey, let's say uh, DC resistivity survey, and on here, then these are structured so that it's broken down into sections. There's physics, there's the survey, there's data, interpretation, and physical considerations. So in each of these, there's a whole bunch of uh, subtrees that that you can look at. The area that I, I really want to concentrate on for, for the moment is, is the case histories. So in case histories, uh, we have a number of case histories that have been compiled. Some of them are from the work that we did at UBC, but others have been contributed to by you know, geoscientists kind of worldwide. So, and we've got a whole host of things, whether in both mineral exploration, environmental work, groundwater, uh, geothermal energy, and seismic hydrocarbons. So they're, they're, they're this, is, this is sort of our list. We'll see this one, Wadi Saba, later on, after we've done inductive source time domain, because this is work that was done by Danielle Colombo at Saudi Aramco and uh, you're looking at time domain EM for near surface structure to get a better velocity model. Uh, we're going to work on Mount Isa. So here's, here's, here's Mount Isa. And we open it up and there's uh, you know a little bit of a prelude as to what the uh, what the uh, case history is. There's a, there's an abstract, and then we have everything in terms of the of the seven steps. Okay, so let's just kind of walk through because the, the slides were really terse summary, but what we're really looking for in the uh, on the case history side, is like we really have some depth to it, and most of these have been based upon 
literature that has been published and uh, yeah, sort of exists. And there will be links to those those papers. Uh, actually, I, I wanted to preface. This is actually kind of interesting. Yeah. Can I go back without? Yeah, there we go. Um, I, I was showing you this morning the, the timeline that we had for geophysical inversions. And in about the year 2000, we were finally capable of inverting 3D DC resistivity data to recover you know, hundreds of thousands or million model parameters. Right? So that was actually that was actually a first for the minerals industry. And I'm pleased that we did that at, at UBC. And the very first field data set that really we worked with was this one. So in 2000, we inverted these data as a kind of a geophysical first. And we published the results. There's the first author was a gal by the name of uh, Rutley on the <laughs> on the paper, and we've we've continued to use those data. And then after you know 15 years later, we revisited the same set of data, but now with new algorithms and you know able to have larger problems. And you know, we just want to see like okay, how much different are the results from with 15 years of uh, improvement. And uh, so part of the case history talks a little bit about that. But let's just look at setup. So if you click on setup, and then what does it say? Well, it's, it's got some information about you know, where, you, where you are, what the, uh, what the real questions are. The questions are really important, always in the setup, because you want to identify the problem that you're really trying to answer. And so here we're trying to find, can 3D DC resistivity actually delineate the, the geology and can we find both conductive and chargeable units? And we also wanted to check to see whether there had been improvement, scenery improvement in the algorithms because of computer enhancement. So then there's the, the, you know, the geologic uh, background that I, that I showed and uh, yeah, so it talks about what the different units are and what the kinds of, uh, <coughs> of, of properties are. And then we've got conductivity. So here's, here's our, our geologic model. It's sort of a, a, a simplified one that we're going to use for doing uh, sur survey design. So uh, here's, here's the model that we've got. We've got mineralization zone. We've got this sort of breakaway shale. We've got volcanics both on the east and the west. And we're going to try to see if we can't find some, something that looks like that. So we have a, uh, a table that lists the physical properties. So here's that conductivity that I showed you, uh, or the resistivity, depending on which way you want to think about it. And then, of course, in the end, we're also going to be concerning with chargeability, but we're going to come back to that on Friday. So what's our survey going to be? Uh, well, we're going to uh, use a DC resistivity survey. You notice that there's a whole bunch of links here. So for instance, this, is, this link says geophysical survey. So it says the fundamentals of a DC resistivity survey can be found in geophysical surveys. So if you click on that, uh, you actually end up back in geophysical surveys. And here's DC resistivity. And then you can go through, you know, the, the physics of the survey. Uh, so here's here's the physics of the survey. So this is what I showed you this morning, that allure deposit, and you know, kind of this takes you through the basics of what I said this morning. Set up your electrodes, put the current through, watch the charges build up, and look to see how that's going to affect the data. And then. Uh, yeah, so here's, th this, is, this is interesting. So we've got, let's suppose that you've got two spheres. Maybe one's conductive and, and one's re resistive. And uh, you, you, you kind of want to know how, how, how things are going, what the charges are going to be, like depending upon where you put the current. So we could actually run a little movie. What we're going to see here is that the, so there's a, 
a conductive uh, prism that's going to be a resistive one. We're going to look at the charges as and the currents as we move the current source from here to here. To just kind of get an idea of what's going on. So again, here you see when the current source is sitting up there, how, how those charges are, uh, are, are coming in. And then as you get over to this one, the, res the resisted one, like that. Okay, so that's kind of, it's something you have to experiment with, but there are so many things in here that are tied together. And the idea is that, okay, so here, here is what we wanted to do. We wanted to have like a case history so that even if you don't know very much, or actually it doesn't matter how much you know about what's going on, you can start to read this case history and anybody could get through it and make some intelligent assessment of, of what's going on. So that means parsing out the case history in that seven step form, that's good. And now you start going through each of those seven steps and you come across a word that you're not really sure what it is, right? What is a geophysical survey? Well, you, there's something to click on and then that brings you back to geophysical surveys and now you've got something DC resistivity. Okay, what's that, right? So you, you click on that and then it takes you to another link and then you like, oh, I wanna ask something about you know, the fundamental physics of what's going on. How does that work? And I can go down and you can tie everything together. I think this is the wonderful thing about having sort of live interactive resources that you can easily move around in because if you if you have a book for instance it just doesn't work there's just too many pages that you're having to flip back through and so we're trying to organize it so that the only thing that you see in your field of vision is the thing that you want to see and need to see and that involves just having all of this material cross-linked and being able to view what you want at the time that you need it to answer whatever question you have. So that's our goal here, and I clearly can't demonstrate all of that, but it's it's just the, uh, I, I can give you kind of a flavor for, for what's going on. So that was the, the properties. Here we have the, the survey, so there's a survey design that's associated with it. So now we've got our geologic model, <clears throat> okay? And we're thinking, well, maybe we put a moderate conductor in there someplace. Are we going to see it? So let's do that. We take this conductor. We're going to put it right up against this uh, high conducting shale and then see what we get. What you're looking at here is the current lines that are going through. So here's the, the current, the source electrode. And then the currents are, are kind of going through here. And this is without the target, and this is with the target. So that's always something that you want to see, right? You're looking for the target. So let's, let's do some simulations with and without. Let's just see how much uh, difference that makes. So what we're going to do now is just Aggressively move the location. This guy. And you can see how things. Let's go to just another one. Okay, so just take a look at this. So we're sitting up here. And here's the currents that are that are going through. There's no uh, mineralized target there. But when I put this target in, you can see now how the currents are kind of being deflected through. So definitely, we're making we're making an impact from the point of view of exciting this body. So we we're changing the current, so we should be changing the fields that, that we measure at the, at the surface. And in fact, we can do that, or we can see that by this thing here. If we look at 
the pseudo section without that body and with the body, you can see now how the data have changed. So this is this seems to be like okay, the survey that we've designed here looks like it should be okay. I should be able to I should be able to see some because there's change in, in the data. If I go ahead and now invert those data, you can see again there's a change. So this is the inversion of the data without that mineralized target, and this is the inversion with. So it's not clearly exactly like this, but the survey has got a, a limited depth of penetration, so we're, we're, we're not really seeing anything much sort of below this region. Okay? Uh, but at the same time, look to see there's there's a very long, uh, high conducting body out, out here, uh, and this is very different from that. So it's not absolute clarity, but we're seeing, we're detecting it, and this is a sign of good, responsible, you know, survey design and trying to make sure that you've got a chance of seeing what it is you're looking for. In fact, that's a, that's an interesting point that carries over anywhere for anything that you're that you're doing. There's two things that are important. One is that if you're going to do survey design, you should have you should be able to see something different in the data. That's that's the first thing. If you can't see any difference in the data, you're hooked. Okay, but let's suppose that you're seeing differences in the data. Ultimately your assessment of what's going on is going to be based upon whatever processing algorithm, and it could be an inversion algorithm, it could be something else. But you should really be running everything through that, okay, and then making your final assessment on survey design by implementing all of the steps in the procedure that you're ultimately going to use to you know, make a final decision. But I think that, that holds everywhere, and certainly for the kinds of things that we do in an ideal world, what we always try to do is not only simulate the, the data, but then carry it forth and do the inversion as we've done here, and say, okay, what am I going to expect? What am I going to expect in my final image if that thing is really there? And so now I, I would expect this kind of elongated lump out of something that there shouldn't be a lump in, and like, okay, that's what I'm looking for. So setting proper expectations uh, is, uh, it is important. So we've done the survey design. Now we're going to uh, <clears throat> collect the data. And in this case, we've got two We've got two kinds of experiments. There's a dipole pole and a pole dipole. So these are the different pseudosections of data as we kind of go north, south. So basically, these are the same data that I showed you before, except we had them on kind of one, one panel each. IP, we won't talk about. Now the processing. Uh, we can invert the data individually. That's what's shown here. So here's the dipole pole data, and here's the observed, predicted, and here's the model. And here is the pole dipole model, observed, predicted, and, and the model. So we've taken not what we're what we're going to do is take the data but invert each survey separately. Just that's kind of like a quality control thing, just to make sure that one data set's not really screwy. And, and what you see is that they're, they're different, right? So we invert one set of uh, two sections, and we get this. We invert the other, the pole dipole, pole, we get something out that looks like that. So those are two different inversion results. And they, they got a lot of similarities, but they're not identical. So what you want to do is you want to have a solution that's actually satisfying both of those data sets. So now you have to somehow amalgamate them. In this case, that's not too hard. We just put them all into the same in inversion and then go ahead and, and do that. Um, 
Yeah, so when we do that, we get th this particular model here. So again, that can be done at, at each line. I just kind of run through those. So as we're as we're going up here and changing the line, inverting both of these guys together, then this is the model that's, that's obtained. So now at least you've got, in, at, at the 2D level, you've got a 2D inversion that is satisfactory with all of the, uh, all of the data. But ultimately, of course, you want to do a 3D inversion, and that's where this guy came in and was sort of at the end where we, where we showed them. Okay, so all of those things are outlined uh, in much more detail in EM GSI. And so all of the case histories that I'm showing you today are, are kind of like that. So it's just like a real quick snapshot. But the extra material and all the links for you to kind of say, well, I don't know what that is. Maybe I can find out by clicking here. Uh, that's that's all done there. Okay, maybe I should stop this. Okay. Um. Okay. So that's. Um, that's it. That's a, an application to mineral deposits, but also kind of a showcasing of what you can expect with EM GSI and how you might start to navigate that and kind of what to expect. Uh, now, I, I want to give you an, another short case history with respect to monitoring <coughs> for the uh, for oil sands. I don't really know how closely this will resonate with people, but this is a uh, this, this is a hydrocarbon place, uh, oil, oil sands, it's heavy oil, and what they're going to do is they're going to inject steam. That steam is going to change the resistivity, and they're going to try to measure that change in the resistivity with uh, a crosswell DC resistivity experiment. The area is up in. Uh, Northern Alberta, it's called the Athabasca oil, oil sands. And the technique is SAG-D. I think I asked what that was, but that stands for Steam Assisted Gravity Drainage. Uh, the area was uh, produced by, or purchased by Stat Oil in 2007. And then they're operating a particular area up here called the Lysmere Demonstration Area. And that was trying to do a little bit of a proof of purchase or proof of concept with respect to using crosswell uh, tomography and other kinds of things too, just to try to delineate where the steam is, uh, is, is going. So here's basically how it works. We've got two parallel uh, wells that are, are drilled. So these are horizontal wells. The top well is injecting steam, and the bottom is the oil producer. So there's steam that's injected. That goes up, makes uh, warms the oil. The oil basically uh, pools down at the bottom, and there's a connecting well in which the oil goes and pumps it back up. So that's the, that's the idea. Uh, it's used quite successfully in uh, in Alberta and perhaps el elsewhere too. And uh, the goal is to try to understand where this where this steam is and where where you're actually uh, getting rid of the or extracting the oil and regions that, that you're on. So we really want to know where where that steam is. So first thing, what is what does Steve do? What, what would we expect for our uh, resistivity uh, contrast? Well, the first thing is temperature. So if I increase the temperature, then the resistivity de decreases. 
So that's that's an important part. The other reason that a resistivity might decrease is that if I'm replacing oil by brine. So again, we'll see that in a number of cases throughout the, this week. Um, but the brine, as we talked about this morning, is very conductive, and uh, <clears throat> if we replace the hydrocarbon, which is resistive by brine, we're going to reduce the resistivity. But Here's what about sorry. Go ahead. What about the 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 contact surface between the steam and the this oil? Uh, I think that the the you could increase the oil, decrease the oil gravity and uh, uh, viscosity. Should it affect the the resistivity of the oil in this case, the oil, just the oil, in contact with the steam front? Um. I, I'm not 100% sure on that. There's a, there, there are complicating issues that come up with exactly what's happening on that steam front and that uh, you know, oil interface contact. In other words, but, does oil resistivity arise with the, the gravity, the density of oil and the viscosity? Uh, I don't think yeah. it's the main driving factor in here. So that there there might well be, but oil is pretty resistive on its own. So in this case, I think the, the biggest thing that's going on is we're adding hot water, and that is going to there's pretty much just sort of two ways it can go. Is if that hot the, the steam starts to dissolve minerals, yes. then that's going to make it more conductive because we have more salts than in the fluid. Um, if that doesn't happen as much, then what's happening is the opposite case, okay. and you're getting condensing steam, which is very fresh, diluting formation fluid. For changing oil by brine. Yeah. yeah. It's a replacement as opposed to perhaps doing too much to the oil itself. I think that would be the major, major thing. The, and the complexities is, is perhaps more illustrated uh, here, this, this is what we kind of like to think about, but really, you know, the, the structural complexity of how everything is uh, it is constructed, and there means that you know, actually following the path of what the steam and the result how long, is. How long does this process take? Steam push the oil. Months to months to years. So it's, it's not instantaneous. No, okay, but months, days. No, months, 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 months years. Months. And, and it's a little different than in this case. Seg D is a bit different than a typical steam flood. <coughs> so steam flood, you would think of the steam <coughs> from the oil. In this case, that's not what's happening. Is you're using the steam to basically heat up the oil because it's very very thick. So you heat it up to thin it out, and then it drains into the bottom well. So the McMurray is very, very porous. So once you can get that oil mobilized, it'll flow. It's a completely new, uh, different reality from, from, from reservoirs. Yeah. And we just used the first one. That's what we are using. Uh, yeah, we, as far as we like don't have pushing. The, this is for very uh, heavy, oil. heavy oil, right? Yeah. yeah. This. Yeah, so we have. We actually have a case history that's a little bit closer related to what you're talking about. I think there are many differences to it's a almost a mining process. Yeah. Not this one, but in other kind of production within a Tabasco oil sand, you simply catch the oil sand, put it in a in Yes, if a it's way. if it's shallow enough, they resort to that. Right. So their ideal world is that you know this, this Atasca region comes right up to the surface and they can just scoop it off in big trucks, they haul it someplace, they heat it up, and they can do it. That's that's option one. If that formation, the Murray formation, gets too deep, then it's just too expensive to do that. So then they need another method of recovery. Because in Brazil, the Spirit Santo basin 
uh, we have some very shallow oil oil pools and the, the, the oil is very very uh, how can I say low 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 API oil it's a very dense oil so we we do uh, inject steam as well produce the single oh, okay. the same I don't think so. Published though, no, but in internal reports we will have. Anyway, that's that, that's basically the, the challenge here and this was, I say, uh, kind of a proof of concept to try to see what they could, whether they could give it just this. This is some indication of at least the resistivity decreasing. So this is resistivity change. These values are all negative. And this axis is temperature. And these are independent studies that have been done. And if you look, let's say, by Ramirez in 1993 is, is, is four, it says that uh, at 100 degrees change in temperature, get anywhere from 40 to 60 percent reduction in the resistivity. So this is 40 percent here, and this is 70 percent here. So between 50 and 150 degrees increase in temperature, then you get like a 50 percent reduction in resistivity. So that's, that's kind of what you're looking for. So how are you going to image? How are you going to image this? So the options you could do uh, 3D DSP, uh, you could do crosswell seismic tomography, you could do crosswell EM, or you could do crosswell DC resistivity. Actually, the crosswell DC resistivity. The other word that you often see for that is ERT, which is electrical resistance tomography. So those two things, those two things mean essentially. Uh, the, some of the challenges is that you have high temperatures up to you know, 250 degrees Celsius, so that instruments uh, need to be able to stand that. And the, the other is that you have steel casings. We're going to talk more about that a little bit later. Uh, but steel casings will change the electrical conductivity and alter where the currents are, are going. And yeah, you need to make sure that things are repeatable. Focus here for this case history is just on the use of uh, DC resistivity. Oh, uh, so by the way, these these are two vertical. So just to elaborate a bit more, on what you're seeing. So these are these are the SAG D wells. So there's a, an injector and a recovery. Well, so there's there's four of these. Sometimes they just go out from pads and then they make them uh, in, into this particular pattern. What we're looking at here are the electrodes for DC resistivity, so that each of these is an electrode, and each can be used as a current electrode or a potential electrode. We can, and we have <coughs> electrodes in this well and electrodes in this well. And you can see that you, know, you have currents in one and potentials in the other, you're getting some information about what is happening. Yes? So those two wells are failed pretty thoroughly tested for a cross well DC survey. I'm sorry, I but So those two vertical wells are failed for that cross well DC survey. Like you need to drill those holes. Yeah, so somehow you need to have, oh. have a drill base. Yeah. But in, in many cases, I think in Alberta, they're actually required to have observation wells that go all the way down. So putting in extra wells is, is, is not a big deal. They're, you're already mandated to do that. But you are also talking about the parts that we in and later then. Right, sorry, yeah. So there is potentially crosswell E M, but they have difficulty here, uh, both cost and also the, the temperature was, was, was pretty high. 
So that wasn't done, but all three of these with the arrows were actually carried out. So they did have, um, yeah, DSP and Crosswell seismic. We'll show you case history later on uh, tomorrow, I guess, uh, where we do Crosswell EM. So here's the idea with uh, Crosswell DC resistivity survey. You've got current electrodes, in this case, in one well, and you've got potential electrodes in another well. There's all kinds of configurations you can use. I mean, you could imagine a current in this well, like an A electrode here and a B electrode here, uh, or you could manage, assume that there's just an A electrode and then you've got one or more potential electrodes. All, all combinations are possible and virtually all have been tried. And to decide which one you want to use, uh, you do a survey design uh, in, in hubs. So this gives you uh, your, your setup. Here would be your resistivity that you'd get. Generally for crosswell things, uh, we'll plot transmitters on one side and receivers on the other. So this particular point here is from transmitter, let's see, transmitter six and receiver seven. And then that gets you that apparent, that apparent resistivity. So you're saying you have multiple numbers of transmitters and receivers? That's correct. So the transmitter it could be up here and then gradually move down and then you could measure data at the receiver location. So this is a bit more explicit on what we had shown before. So it's this the same geometry. Uh, the region of interest is about 300 meters. There's a you know a pay zone in in here. The uh, the, the reservoir is, is a bit smaller than that. Uh, there's 32 electrodes in each of these wells. They're denser uh, at the reservoir, and there's also a DGS system. And as I said, the important part is that you need to make sure that the instruments can have a high temperature. You'd like to make this so it's as much hands-off as possible. So you like to have just an automated system. So that's what they do. They um, put these current electrodes in, and they just run it automatically so that you know twice a day you're just doing a full DC resistivity survey. And that actually helps with you know, repeatability and allows you multiple uh, Realization so that you can stack and reduce the noise. You try to get higher quality data. So they can get quality data within you know, a couple of percent. Doing the inversion, so you got the two, the two wells. This is separated by 150 meters. And you're going to start, again, you need to start from someplace. So let's start from what's known about the geology, the geologic logs, and uh, any information you've got, build a 3D model. In this case, the uh, conductivity or resistivity between those two wells looks looks like this. So the high resistive region in here, that's the reservoir, right? Remember, so the petroleum, hydrocarbon, 100 ohm meters or more. Uh, so that's what is really of interest. If you take the baseline DC resistivity data and you invert them, using this as a starting and reference model, because that's kind of what you think is there, uh, you, you end up with something that looks like this. So it's uh, kind of very similar, but there's, there's differences. So this is what has been recovered from doing a baseline DC resistivity survey that was carried out in 2000. So you mean you have an injection? There's no injection. This is prior to any injection. So this is what you think. Like, okay, that's that's what's here right now. Now we're going to start to inject, and then let's let it go for a while and let's see what happens. Now we do time lapse. That was what happened in March 2011, and then in two years, 
April of 2013, uh, this is what has, has transpired. So now you've got something that looks pretty much the same, but the area of the reservoir is up in, in, in here, and you notice that these are kind of less red, so it's less resistive. If we actually look at the resistivity differences between the baseline and the 2013, uh, this is what you get here. So this is the reservoir region. Here is the injection well, here's the production well on one side, here it is on the other. And especially on this, you notice that this area is quite blue, which means that the resistivity has dropped by something in the order of 80%, which is good, that, that's, a, that, that's a big change. And over here, it's also dropped, but it's, it's a bit, uh, it's off a little bit from being exactly co-located. So not not really sure what's happening there. But you know, in general, within that reservoir region, resistivity has dropped. And if you match that with the the VSPs, okay, so what we're looking at here is the uh, on the west well, which is this guy here, the, the VSP. Uh, the baseline is in blue and the repeat, well actually this is 2012, so it's a little bit earlier than 2013, looks like that. So there's some difference in there. And over on the east well, it's even more, more significant. So th what you're looking at here is, um, yeah, the velocity, basically the velocity as a function of depth, and you see the velocity decreases which is kind of consistent with uh, you know, steam being there and reducing the velocity. So at least it's consistent. No? Uh, we get an image. It's got some consistency with sizing. I mean, it's looking like it has, has, has potential. And if you look at the in interpretation, if, so here's the time lapse after six months, 12 months, and 18 months. This is what the difference in that resistivity looks like. So after six months, it's yellow, so it's maybe 10%. 12 months, it's starting to get up to maybe 30%. And 18 months, it's like 50% in these two ranges. I have a question. Yeah. This uh, position system will uh, keep it inside the well, or you have to remove and then remove it? So it's all done, the electrodes are all kind of taped to the outside of the, of the casing. And it's all kind of one unit, all cemented in. And, and that's just the to, to deploy these during, after, just after the drilling. You cannot like use a, a drilled well, a closed well to install the system. This, this was done while drilling, so they had actually put the electrodes outside. Well, the well. Um, so, yeah, for the specifics of it, if you want the electrodes outside the well, I don't know if there's ways to do it. But I imagine that would be a lot harder. And there was some. How long it takes, for example, if you want to put the system, how long it takes uh, to install this? Because each day you are drilling is more expensive. No, I think all the drilling is. I mean, I, I think they're doing the whole drilling and putting in the casings before they start doing any of the resistivity surveys. So, uh, right, but I don't, I don't know if adding the geophysical system added any time to the drilling or not. I would imagine yeah. not much, um, but I probably the, again not one hundred percent sure. But probably the biggest time is just preparing. You know, all of those drill stems to you know, putting the electrodes on them and the outside, just making sure that everything is fine. But after that, everything is kind of, I understand, everything's kind of taped in. And now you're just yeah. dropping yeah. this thing. Just for you for right us, in. the first question that a manager will do is how long they will keep the. Yeah, 
the week. week. The week. The week. The week. How long more you, you need the week there to put the system? So, how this impacts on the cost right. of the building? Can't answer 100%, but I, my guess is that it's not, that is not an, a significant amount of extra time. The, the main thing would be in preparing all your casings, right? Because there you need to actually put your electrodes on, you need to tape them in, you need to make sure everything is done. But once you've done that, then the time to put something, put a, a drill stem in that's got a little, few things on the outside versus nothing, doesn't seem like that should be it. And, and the well that you use to, to measure? Can be a producer or an injector too, or don't know. You can't do anything to that. Things become complicated if you actually have, uh, you know, steel cased wells. And if you're a producer, and I don't know that you could, I, I, I don't think you could measure anything in a producing well. Maybe. I don't know. I, I don't know. I think it's probably actually. Possible, but you would have to know before that it's also intended to be instrumental. In this case, these were designated observation wells, so they weren't producers. Um, yeah, but I, I'm not too sure. Yeah, so just as far as uh, as a synthesis, if you look at the kind of the results at, let's say at a particular point here as a function of time and see what the resistivity is. You know, it's kind of decreasing as a function of time you know, by 80%. So there's some, some fluctuations. I have no idea how they really are or whether they're something else. But I mean, in general, there's, there's a linear straight line. So here you basically just uh, show the chain of resistivity. So can you use this to kind of generate uh, like temperature profile um, of all those wells? Or, or like again, not now. There's there's quite a few things that can give rise to a resistivity change. So. Temperature, temperature is one. We've seen that. The, the other is the fact that you know you're replacing the hydrocarbon with water, so that will be another. So it's you you now have a multi-parameter system. Like okay, I've got conductivity, okay, but what is actually causing? Yeah, that? because eventually, as you mentioned in the beginning, the final goal will you want to know where your steam goes, right? So, so I'm basically I'm asking like from here to, to like to determine where your steam is or like where is your boundary between your steam chamber and your oil. Um, so, like how big, like how much does that take? How long does that take to to accomplish? <coughs> like from here to just like you you already see they're changing your resistivity to generate some like some um, like saturation profile or temperature profile because that will be their end goal of this study right perhaps this is where you could you know start to bring in you know some numerical modeling yeah. uh, you know you're, you're putting in something with a particular temperature right and so you're monitoring or computing how you know, the temperature is actually going to change. And then you've got also perhaps two phase flow that you're going to con be concerned with. And now you're at j just a, another level of problem. But the, the good thing about this is that you know, there's at least some significant change. And so there's some hope that maybe that will actually tell you something. I, I think it'd be too much to ask to go directly from these images here to the, the answer exactly where the steam front is and 
that, that's a more complicated process. But if we didn't have change here, then you don't have to worry about the other stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the last topic to talk about, and this is really Lindsay's uh, work that she's been doing with her on, on, on her PhD, but I'll just give you a quick rundown. But if you have any real questions, you can ask her. <laughs> One of the uh, things that has really sort of caught the hydrocarbon community by a little bit of a storm recently uh, is the, steel, the use of steel casings um, for, for their wells and the potential for not uh, being, really the potential for using them for good as opposed to just some kind of uh, extra confusion, pottery thing for electromagnetics. So the, uh, the idea here is that, and it was first put out a long time ago, there was quite a bit of enthusiasm in the 19. 90s, uh, if you look through the old literature, the idea that if you have a big long casing, it's just like an extended electrode. So if, if we think about a current electrode, so on what we talked about so far, you know, we, we said, oh, we'll, we'll put in a, we'll put in a little electrode and we'll attach a, a current generator to it. And so we got a current that kind of comes out like that. And I, I, I showed pictures of exactly that, that happened. But now the question is, okay, what happens if you have a, a, have a current, electrode, have an electrode, and now you have something that comes out, I suppose it looks like this. So now I put it on. So what, what do you think actually is gonna happen in that case, if I just extend the electrode? Is the shallow part, the current, will be almost entirely in the conductor? Somehow. It's like a... Yeah. Sorry, side, yeah, so the current just, just sort of comes in and goes up bottom? Yeah, it's like just putting a deeper source. Yeah, so I'm just taking, taking this geometry and just, it's just like, Putting, yeah, so if this is three kilometers down, then you know the current kind of comes out like this, and, and we see some. So it's, it's, it's funnel, funnel down. Yeah, anybody else? This actually, I mean, if this happens, and an advantage of that, like, is if, if you've got if you've got a target down here. So let's suppose you've got. Um, let's suppose you got an oil field, okay, and you've gone in and you've done a first stage extraction, and most of your wells are kind of really low producers now, and uh, so now you want to see, well, wait a minute, maybe there's some zones that I missed. Could I possibly use uh, these kind of techniques to, to find some things? So now the idea is, as Carter was just mentioned, if you have a a long, basically a long electrode, okay, uh, then you could put that in here. And now if the current kind of comes out here, then you're going to excite this, excite this body. Uh, that's going to be much different than if you put a current in here and you have here where the, you know, the currents are just kind of coming out here. By the time they get out here, they're already pretty small and you're not going to excite this body. So, yeah, the, the kind of thought process is, is something that, that, that's like this. So that's, uh, that, that, that's a, a lot to do with the, you know, the basic idea, but it's actually just a bit more complicated than that. And that is that the, if you put a, uh, and it, it depends a lot where exactly you're going to hook your current to, whether you hook it up to the top or whether you, have a wire that comes down in here and, and, and hooks it up to, to there. So we can have what are called top hole um, grounds or you could have a current that is actually coming out in, in 
inside. And they'll also all give you slightly different um, you know, sources of, of information. The one I want to talk about here is one in which you've got a you've got a steel casing, so looking like this, okay, and then you've got and wire line that's, that's coming down in here, and you're, you're going to have an A electrode that's actually right at that depth. And then the question is, how is the how is the current going to, to go out? So there's a couple things that are going to happen. One is and it's kind of illustrated in this uh, in, in this plot here, and this is a plot that was actually generated by Kaufman in 1990. So what we're looking at here, this it, this is a, the casing, so that it's cylindrical. So here's the two outsides of the casing. It's one, that's the other. So the inside is filled with mud, and then there's a wire that's going down, and it, there's the A electrode down, down here. And now there's current that is going to get uh, exiting from this electrode here, and that current's going to go outward. So now the question, where, where is that current actually going to go? Well, first of all, there's this conducting casing here, so the current kind of go, could go up through the, the casing. Uh, that current also has to eventually leave, so it's got to go, and the currents could exit from the casings of like this. If we had gone back to this case here where we had mounted a, a current electrode right at the top, uh, actually because this casing is conducting, it wouldn't all come out of the bottom, but it'll sort of come out uh, at various points along here so that there's actually a, a decay in the total current as it's, as it's going down. So this was the image that was done in, as I say, 1990, and it shows that if you have a, uh, a uh, an electrode out here, that there's current that's going to emanate from that that electrode, going to go into the into the casings, and then also a lot of the current is going to kind of come up the casings. And wherever current goes into or out of the casing, there's going to be a charge. So in this region down here, where current is kind of coming out, imagine current that's just leaving here and just going straight up. So it enters the casing here. Now we go for resist to a conductor, so we get a negative charge. And then it continues on out and goes from a conductor to a resistor, so there's a positive charge of here. In the work that uh, that Lindsay did, she's got a, a 2D silk coat that uh, works. That's also something that you'll have uh, access to. Uh, we could plot the charges, uh, both the total charge as well as the uh, as the secondary charge. So what we're seeing in here is that the total charge. So we've got a current here, right in, in the middle. So it's <laughs> there's a positive charge there. And now as that current goes into the extract to the outside, it hits this casing and a lot of it just kind of gets funneled right in, into that on both sides. And that is the bulk of the of the charge. But just the same as we did this morning, when you look at the total charge, you know, like, okay, it's, it's really a target <coughs> field. If we look at the the difference between this total charge and just the primary uh, fields that would happen just if you have a current source and no uh, <laughs> and no casing, then that secondary charge gives something like this. So what we see here is that there's an extended negative charge that's in here and then a positive charge that's distributed along the whole Casing. So, in other words, as you, if you look to see how the currents are flowing, so we've got a current that's coming in here. There's some current that's coming right out like this, and then 
later, later on, most of the current is, is kind of, once it gets channeled into this conducting pipe, it basically just flows upward and downward and then eventually flows out like this. So the high concentration of charges is sort of right in this region in here. And then there's continual positive charges on the outside as it goes, as it goes up. So this is actually quite nice. I, I think this shows the, uh, like the real potential advantage of being able to do things numerically. Uh, Kaufman, when he, he did this, had an analytic expression, so it was wonderful work. And he had this diagram that showed what the distribution of charges would be and, and, and what the currents are. And when you look at the numerical results, you actually see that they're very, very similar to, to this. The um, Most of the radio currents, so what we're looking at here are the uh, electric fields, and here we're looking at the currents. The, the electric fields are primarily kind of out right around here. There's uh, uniformity of fields going vertical. Once you get about 10 radii, <coughs> cylindrical radii away. And if you look at the currents, you can see how the currents are actually channeled in through the, through the, through the casings. So you get a chance to kind of see, okay, where's the currents, where's the charges, and uh, kind of understand the physics of what's going on. This was used uh, in 2010 uh, in, in the Hanford area. It's in, Washington State, there was a lot of uh, nuclear waste that was being stored in tanks, and some stuff was just being put in waste uh, waste deposits. And there's a number of sets of tanks here, some of which are leaky, and some of which are kind of still intact. And what they want to do is to see, okay, could we find out where the uh, where the leakage was? So they've got. Uh, Cased wells that they, or these were all uncased wells. No, they were cased. They, yeah, cased wells that they uh, that they used as extended electrodes. So now what they're doing is just hooking things to the top of the electrode and then having currents sort of emanate all the way down through and and out the end. And that then gives you you know much greater penetration depth. So they, here, here's sort of the justification of that. So this is a synthetic example. It's a conductive block in, uh, that's sitting just, just below the, the surface. So it, the waste deposits should be conductive. So if we <coughs> use uh, a DC survey, but just with electrodes at the surface, uh, and we go ahead and invert, then you actually get this kind of an image. So it's, it's not too bad. You still see localized where things are, especially at the top. Uh, you, you lose some resolution as, as you go down. But if you take that same experiment and now you put in the uh, steel electrodes, and, Depth, so that's what these vertical lines are. And now you use those as electrodes, take those data, invert them, and then you get this result up here. So this is actually a really good representation of what that initial synthetic uh, conductivity block was. So again, it just shows that by using the wells as extended electrodes, uh, you've got a lot more penetration. Yeah. And then because they had put uh, waste on the on the surface and also because there's a lot of infrastructure that's there and so you can imagine if you've got you know an, an area that's just got lots of pipes and steels and, and stuff it's just so easy for a current if you're putting it in to kind of get channeled at various places so how to account for that well uh, in this case they said well let's just put in 
a high conductivity layer up, up here, and now do the same experiment. When you do that, then you don't see anything. So from the surface survey, you just don't see. But if you revert to the uh, electrodes that are going down in, in the depth, to extend electrodes, then you actually uh, see that quite quite nicely. So I think the, uh, the, the take home message here was that when you go and use these extended electrodes, uh, you actually can see deeper and you have a much better chance of seeing what's there. And this was the result of the field survey. So the uh, leakage that they were interested in was in this area. And when they did do that survey with the steel casings, uh, they actually picked that up quite well, as well as a region up over here that had some toxic waste to it. So there's, as I said, there's a lot of enthusiasm in the oil industry at, at this point for uh, using these steel case wells. There, there's a couple of reasons, that, and you can see, see them here. Uh, so if you're trying to do enhanced oil cover, or carbon capture and storage, uh, you've got small targets and, and they're deep. If you don't have any casings, then here's how the currents go, right? That's what we're looking at this morning. Okay. Uh, so if you've got something down here, you're simply not going to excite it. But if you have a casing, then the whole casing is kind of lit up, it's got an extended electrode. And now you can imagine if I had a, a target down here, then uh, you know, I've got currents that are going out, so I'm now having a chance to uh, to excite that. Another area that uh, is being pursued is the potential for you know pipes as they get uh, get older can sometimes get corroded, and the question is, could you you know if you did have a corroded pipe and it had a gap in it, uh, could you actually find it? And so a numerical example here shows what happens. So it, here's, uh, here, here's a casing, uh, it's a kilometer long, and if uh, it's intact, then the currents go like this, the charges get distributed over the whole region, and the electric fields look, look like that. If you had a break in the pipe, so let's suppose at 500 meters, you have this break. Then now the currents are, are interrupted. They, so you're going to put a current at the top, right? and the currents come down, but then they hit this break, and they can't go through the break, and at least not easily. The resultant is that you only get currents primarily on the top. The charge distribution now looks like this. And so you're very sensitive to what that uh, that there is is a break and perhaps how deep it is so that's an area i think that uh, has got a lot of potential for further development you know, and that i think would work for better browse as well as anybody else i mean you always got wells out there that you know, at some point you're wondering what their integrity is and if they're corroded and you know maybe you know this kind of electromagnetics has got some uh, ability to help answer that. Uh, oh, well, this was just an example for what the actually the electric field or the observations uh, would be. So, if you had the baseline well versus the, the flawed well, that there is actually a, a difference, uh, a significant difference in that final potential. Is, is the pipe to the, the well or to pipe? Uh, this applied well to the like directly to the casing. This or yeah, no, I'm just thinking because uh, you mentioned that uh, it would be hard to do this in a production or injection well, right? So. so let me see if I'm, I'm answering your question here. So in this case, the, the experiment that we did is actually you just connect one electrode to the top of the casing. You have a return electrode somewhere else. So everything is from the surface. And then you're measuring uh, potentials on the surface. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. You don't need to put the electrolyte inside the well. No. But you would need to know what the uh, response of that well would be 
you know, prior to any corrosion or something like that, so that you can find the difference. Or at least need to know the background geology and how long the well should be. Well, it itself is in that country. But how the um, the charges are distributed on the well will depend upon you know the length of it as you know and as well as the geology around the outside. And if you shorten the well, I and mean, that's effectively what you're doing, you're making a flaw, right? You shorten it, then that's going to change the response. And then you need some special facility to drain these things on the surface, or right? is this applied to offshore wells too, or just onshore? There's there's a well, for instance, there's a there's a company called Ground Metrics out of California that's got high sensitivity. Uh, electric field measurements and they're actually using those kinds of uh, uh, survey equipment in fields where they're, they're doing injections for uh, sort of monitoring at depth and trying to see if they can find something using an extended drill hole. But just on land or offshore? It's on land. I'm not sure. I mean, offshore, everything is pretty quiet. So I think electric electric field measurements on the ocean bottom are, are usually pretty quiet. So you might well be able to do that. Again, that would require numerical. I think the problem is the water depth. Water, water depth. And not not only that, but but probably you need to be like uh, I don't know, I don't know, connected to some. Yes. Station or something to record to receive the data, something like that. Well, you need some power source to inject. To that, yeah. 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 Or a medical vision. I don't know what it has. You need some special facility to measure this. Just, we, I'm just asking because most of us are working with offshore fields. Yeah. That, that's a really good question. I think it's an open question. There's one study that was done um, by Andre Sudensky. And so they were looking at, um, so it wasn't a casing integrity application, but they were looking at the impact of um, steel case portals on potential marine measurements. And so they did show that the steel casings have an effect. Um, so there's definitely evidence that, that potentially, I mean, we can see them. And so that's certainly motivation to look into, look into this. But yeah, um, certainly on the land they've got sensitive receivers and you know the receivers that they're using for ocean bottom work are actually pretty sensitive and you know, it's it's quiet environment so again you know, it might depend upon you know the depth of, of the water to whether you're in just you know, 40 meters of water or whether you're in you know, 1500 meters of water so i think uh why don't we uh, have a little bit of change of pace, uh, Lindsay? You can just talk maybe a little bit about uh, the apps and just kind of you know, how, how to load them, and then we can maybe try downloading or using one, and then have a have a copy. So there's um, a couple ways to access the apps, but the first thing that I'm going to show is just once you get in there, uh, what the interface is, how to use it, and then we'll go through step by step and uh, get you up and running with them. So first off, the environment that we're using is the Jupyter Notebook environment. Um, and so this is open source software that's been developed for interactive computing. Uh, it was first, a lot of the development was done for Python, um, but it actually works for almost any computing, modern computing language at this point. So the name actually, Jupyter, um, so the PY is um, Python, the JU is uh, Julia, so that's a, a, a newer language. It's very similar to MATLAB in a lot of senses. Um, and then R is another common uh, modern language that's used a lot in statistics. 
And so anyways, those are the main three, but we'll be using it for, for Python. So you've, has anybody here seen Jupyter or used Jupyter before this? No? A little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so what's really neat is you, it is a, a place where you can combine code, mm -hmm. uh, you can combine text, and then these interactive widgets and things like that are all within that environment. So the way that we've set these ones up is we don't actually show you too much code. There's another set of notebooks that we do have that you're, if you're interested in learning how we actually do the coding uh, and how we program up the DC resistivity equations and things like that, you can go to those notebooks. I'll show you where those are. Um, but these ones are really designed to get you right away to the interactive app. Uh, so when you get into the Jupyter environment, you first actually have to bring all the code in that we're going to use. And so in order to do that, you just go to cell at the top and then you can do run all. Um, so there's a few different platforms that you can use to actually access the apps, but we're going to run them online on a service called Binder. And so it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, so we'll get that up and running right now. So we'll start from, uh, from EMGOSI. We'll go here. So actually, if you're on EMGOSI, so the URL is um, em.geosci.xyz. So this is, again, the page that you land on. And then uh, the first um, navigation item here is the apps. Uh, so as I was mentioning, there's two styles. So the ones that Doug has shown so far are these EM apps. Um, these are widgets and meant to be something that you can play with the physics. The other style that we have are these simulation notebooks, and these expose all of the code to you. So later, later on, if you're interested in seeing how we, again, how we program things up, those are the ones to look at. But all the steps for running them are very similar. Uh, so if you go here uh, and you click on the Launch Binder button, uh, you'll come to a page that looks like this. And so right now we're just seeing a static view. What's actually happening is, is they're grabbing all of the notebooks that we've written um, from GitHub, and they're actually spinning up a compute environment for us. And so sometimes it can take a couple minutes if it's busy or um, if, um, yeah, if, if it's busy or if the notebooks haven't been used recently. And so then if you um, wait a couple minutes, we get to this page, which is our index page and tells you just a bit about all of the notebooks. Um, so there's the contents here. And then the other thing, we've got a couple pointers on actually, again, running the notebooks in case you forget how to do that. Um, so here we can pull up, I don't know, is there anyone in particular that you're interested in revisiting? Any any one of the apps that Doug has shown that you want to see again? Or actually, uh, let's... Start with the layer. Layered layer? Earth. Layered Earth. Earth. Okay. Earth. Perfect. That's the first one. Excellent. So we just click on that, and that's going to get that one up and running. Um, and you'll notice here, so it, it opened up in a new tab. So if you ever wanted to go back and look at the index page again, it's it's still sitting there. So it's still sitting just on one tab over. Um, so here uh, is the DC layered earth. And so we're again combining some code. We've tried to give a bit of a write up of what's going on, as well as a description of what all the parameters are so that you, you know what the, the widgets do. So then to actually go and run this, uh, we do cell and then run all. You see that? So cell is in the top and then run all. So that's just going to go through and run all of the code for this. If you wanted to, you can run um, individual cell by cell. And that's a good thing to do when you're walking through like more code intensive notebooks. But this one was designed to just have you run, run through the whole thing. So we'll do that right now. And some of these take um, a minute or two because we are actually running numerical simulations under the hood, right? So to give you an image when you're asking for an image of the currents, um, it, it can take a minute is because it is actually going to go and compute that. And sometimes when you're running on free infrastructure, like what we're doing, you can't expect that it's we're getting the fastest computers. And so if you do actually want to be running these a lot, 
Uh, we also have steps for you to download them and run them on your own machine. Um, so that's all in there. And if you run into any issues downloading and running them, uh, you can ping us on Slack or send us an email and we're happy to help you get up and running. Um, so yeah, here is then the, the DC resistivity app. Um, and so we can go in and look at the model, potentials, uh, electric fields, currents, um, and change change the different resistivities and currents like them. Are there any Are there any questions with that? Are people able to actually get up and running yes. so far? Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Um, well, maybe what I'll do. In, in some of the notebooks, actually at the bottom, we've added questions and things like that to guide what you're doing. Not all of them have it. Um, so we added a few questions just to sort of prompt. I mean, I'm sure some of you by now have, have your own, um, but if not, it's often helpful to just have something that's guiding um, what you're doing instead of just willy-nilly um, moving the slide bars. Mm -hmm. So here's a couple, a couple questions to prompt um, exploration on some of the apps that we looked at today. Okay. okay. Well, should we okay, let's take break for coffee? Okay. Yeah, and feel free to grab us if you're running into problems or have questions.
So we have uh, negative uh, charges here and right? positive charges here. Oh, this is Soviet pen, so I can just. So we have negative. That is right. <laughs> you have your iPad. But then, oh, okay. So I, I use this a lot when I do my game captures. I can just go back and use it. It's a long follow up. This is what I like to do. That's it. As you can see, we still just have all the notes. So we have negative charges here, right? We also have here. I was reading the direction of the going inside this circuit, inside this circle. The reason why I put the current is moving a positive charge. If I put the positive charge here, then the, I mean, because we have no charge here, positive charge here, then the force on this positive charge is existing. So the charge is moving in the direction of positive charge. So we have the current flow this way. Apparently, that was wrong. So I was trying to see where I was wrong. Do you see what I mean? It's, it's the same conundrum that you that you end up with in uh, let's say in magnetics, right? So if you have a you have a body, uh, you have a, a charge, a magnetic charge, then the you know the direction of the magnetization okay, is in the direction of the primary yeah, 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 yes, right. right? But yes. then if you actually look at the magnetic charges, they're actually 
reversed from the point of so the way around the but, but you're right. We're right. Not it's not right. Right. It's not right. It's not right. Yeah. Yeah. So there's 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 your there's your yeah. so then that's so like, this this is a source. It's a battery. Right? It's it's exactly it's like a battery. Well, inside the battery it's it's toxic, right? You can go from low to high. Okay, that's what happens inside the battery. Yeah. 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 So then if you think about uh, like an hour, you connect uh, uh, and then it turns into wire, uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, the current actually follows the other yeah. direction. And, and, that, and that that is consistent with what we have here. Yeah, this uh, yeah, this looks as so much the same as the battery. It, it is exactly. Exactly. It's, it's a source, right? Yeah. So yeah. whenever you have a source, then what's happening internally has got the opposite. As I said, it's, it's the same as the magnetization. Yeah, yeah, and you. When you look at so your charges, so you got this great big positive charge here, and you got this negative charge at the top, positive charge at the bottom. So if you're going to think about, okay, from the back, you know, from this block, if I'm going to draw something from positive to negative, then it's going the wrong way. So it's the battery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, if you want, like, if you're thinking about it, then we'll be charged, that's very hard to do. Oh yeah, yeah, that, that is what, what got me yeah, very hard to do. Yeah. That was the point thinking. where the current is actually going down. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, I, I don't know how, how good that can That is something I think deserves, because yeah. it's subtle. It is. Yeah. So how yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, just look at but you, you, you are a, a prodigy of Yahua. Okay. Oh, you mean the... Well, Yahua was... Charged. Yeah, he no, no, but he he was always the, the, the person who said, okay, but wait a minute, we've got a source here, so that you know, the direction, you know, the vector direction of what we got is always opposite yeah, yeah, because yeah, it's yeah, a source. Yeah. I mean, this is really interesting because this is really simple. I didn't a simple model you came up with, but but the physics here is it's not it's not that simple. I mean, you have to learn a lot from this. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how did that fit the kind of second secondary current? Did you, did you subtract the uh, current from right, the half space from the yeah. okay. okay. So as I said, if you look at the secondary electrical field, then actually it's the secondary electrical field. Because uh, like I need to, yeah. Uh, like a, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I was playing with that. Okay, cool. Thank you. You're going to owe us so much. Hopefully. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll, I'll have in the last few weeks just looking at all these pictures. Uh, you see a couple of them. Yeah. This picture is super helpful. Isn't that? Images are amazing, right? Oh, yeah. Just to be able to plot the fields. Yeah. Yeah. And trying to connect your understanding mm. from the equations with these pictures. Yes. You know? That's. <laughs> well, and, and frankly, every time you do something that's a little bit new, honestly, you get, you get tripped up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand that or not. Yeah, yeah. And things, especially as you get into uh, yeah, that took me quite a while.
Oh, that was in the past tense. Did you get that? Oh, yeah, yeah. We were silent. 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 We were sil
So I think it's worth worth a bit of time just to kind of think a little bit about the effects of the of the, of the background and what we have to worry about or not. So here's a good example. We're back to our cylinder. We've got a 500 ohm meter background, one ohm meter cylinder, and you know we do that gradient array. So we got a current electrode here. So we're we're definitely exciting the target. And here's our potential electrodes, and we got apparent resistivity of 430 ohm meters. Uh, it's indicative, like there's something that's low res resistivity here. Okay, so that's that's good. What happens if I take this, okay, if I take this uh, conductivity model, a resistivity model, and I put on a thin layer up, up top of it, so I put a thin layer that's highly resistive, okay? Then the question is, what's going to happen to my ability to see that, uh, that, that target? And we've got some... Andre, do you have a thoughts about that? I'm going to put a thin resistor up there. Pardon me? I know. I know. <coughs> Uh, I'm going to put a thin resistor, a, a little layer, yeah. but highly resistive. What, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Yeah. Um, with respect to identifying the super. Yeah, we're 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 trying we're trying to find this th this guy here, and, and we can see that we actually did pretty well. If it's just buried in this half space, currents are going in. Current resistivity is 430 ohm meters. It's less than 500. I mean. We're doing not too bad. Um, maybe this is when we do the antiquity because we start the the, the lines of the currents will if it started somehow, so it will pose another antiquity or if we don't to invert and find the or our target. Okay. Uh, any any elaboration on how the currents might be distorted? If it's a uh, very resistive, uh, the current actually will try to avoid this thin layer. I guess uh, the lines there will go down a little bit. Yes. Yeah, just avoid the. You will be concentrated the whole. Because if below the resistivity layer. Pardon me? We will be concentrated, the lines will be concentrated and below the resistivity layer. No, no, I got to put a resistivity layer in. Let's say it. Ah, in the middle of the model. Pardon me. In the middle of the model. Yeah, uh, just up above the above the target. Pardon me. Infinite layer. Yeah, just a small thin, thin layer, but it's not that bacteria barrier or the. Or the, the lines. Okay, so now, yeah, both both Marcus and Sergio, yeah, both say that it's going to affect it by keeping the currents up. So let's see what happens. Yeah, and that's what happens, right? So if I put a thin layer up there of resistive material, then the currents can't penetrate that. So they, they just sort of hang up there and they uh, just flow. They go from current electrode A to B, entirely in that upper layer. Okay. Look also at the apparent resistivity. <coughs> so back here, without that layer, it was 430 ohm meters. So we, you know, we saw dip, right? But what happens here? We get. 1600 meters. So it's way above even the background. Is that reasonable or not? Yes. Yes? Yes. Yes. Great. 
because the, 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 the upper end for the same thing. Yeah. Right. So if we had a, like we forget about the existence of this cylinder here, right? So then we just have a, yeah, a one D Earth, right? It's, you know, it's five hundred ohm meters, and then something really resistive, and then five hundred ohm meters. And so if you did a DC resistivity survey, you think, oh, I'm going to be sensitive to this, you know, really resistive layer. So having a resistivity of 1600 ohm meters, it's like I'm doing a good job. I'm finding that resistive layer. I was think of the, if you go back to fundamental school, the, uh, we have a, this uh, quite simple model the resistance of a, an element in a circuit, like the resistivity times the length divided by the, the area, right? right? Yeah. So it's like to, uh, if you have a high resistivity, the deeper and all the currents in a limit case all the currents go just by the shallower part yeah so it's like the all the flow goes just by the shallow part so it's like an effectivity smaller transversal area to the currents to flow so it's like instead of going through all the media yeah. the current just goes to the the shallow part so going back to that equation it's like having an effectivity smaller transversal area so okay. it would increase the resistance of the media i don't know if the analogy works that's how i uh, there's a lot of in there i'm not sure it's, uh, so like there's, if, if you do a, a little laboratory model right put a uh, a current a voltage across and then yes. you measure the, the, the current then the uh, yeah the resistivity is our you know the resistance L upon a something like that in the <laughs> afternoon um, and so there there is definitely a length scale and an area that come, come yeah into play. Uh, so uh, uh, yeah okay. a question I don't know if I'm going yes, but anyway uh, how can you differ uh, that uh, that setting with a high thin layer and a, a, a low background resistivity with a constant how can you differ that from a constant uh, background with 1652 resistivity uh, well, can, uh, if you just had one number then you don't know but if you did you know different different spacings here with your current electrodes, then you would find different because they wouldn't all be 1,652. Just, just by uh, setting different uh, spacing between the the N and the N, I can. Yeah, uh, or changing any of the like the current configurations, that, then that'll change the the number. So that if you just had if you just had this layer here, uh, you'd get out different apparent resistivities every time you have a different different geometry for your electrons. The thing that might be interesting here is you just say, okay, well, what happens if I did the modeling, okay, but without this guy? So I'm just going to leave the resistive layer in. But take out the take out the, uh, the the cylinder. If I do that, I actually get this next picture, which looks like this. So here's here's where you really now understand, like everything is being controlled by this resistor in here. If we look at the currents in in here, they're the same as there, and if we look at the apparent resistivities. That's essentially the same as, as that. So without the conductor, with the conductor, I make any difference at all. So we're not, we do not see that conductor when we've got this resistive layer. So this is a really big deal. We've done all this work, and we've shown like, okay, we've got this tunnel underneath there, right? 
It's a resistor, it's a conductor, it doesn't matter. We show, we show that, oh yeah, we can, we can see this guy. And then somebody comes along and puts in like a layer of something that's really resistive. And now all of the currents are forced above there and you don't see anything underneath. Yeah, that's it. I think that's a very analogous to a seismic situation that we look at like a, uh, the basalts have a shallow area in Brazil that have a huge uh, basalt area. Yeah. So the seismic waves almost just go in the shallow part and it's very hard to see below, oh, okay. below it because yeah. all the waves, it's like a shield. All the waves go. Yeah, goes, so, that yeah. so that's, that, back. That's, that's, that's very simple. Very, you just, somehow it's, you know, you've got a, a variation in that geologic background that is just then keeping all of the energy up yeah, in top. the shallow front. Yeah, that's it. So that's a big deal. So you put a well there and just <laughs> send the currents <laughs> below Very the shell. Very good. Yeah. Oh, point. <laughs> we should. Did, oh, did we bring the stars? Well, I well, we bring the stars. No, we get we get gold stars. <laughs> okay, so that's uh, that's what happens with the resistance. What 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 would happen if we took that same layer and made it conductive? Almost the same, but you you can't see below, but with the difference. Because the, the currents will be concentrated in the conductivity. Yeah. Perfect. Oh, we need two gold stars. So if we have a conductive layer, now look what happens. So now all of the all the current just goes down into the conductor, zips along, and then back up. Now the apparent resistivity is 47 meters. So if you're looking for a conductor from this, you're like, oh, this, this looks pretty good, 47 meters. But uh, that low conductivity or low resistivity is simply because of this conductive layer here. And in fact, if we take that uh, cylinder out, we get the same, same result. So that means if we have a thin conductor or a thin resistor, we could be hooped with DC resistivity. Um, so there's a there's an app. I'm not going to I'm not going to show you that now. We might pick that up tomorrow because I want to move on to something that kind of takes us up over the, uh, the, the this barrier here. But there is, a, is an app that allows you to do that simulations of having a layer and then putting a conductor. So, and, and that's very informative. You, you look at that and you really get it, start to get a, a sense of like how the background is going to affect the currents. And you know, you can, you can look at the charges on that and you can see that at some point I just don't see it. And because you can vary the thickness of this layer and you can vary its resistivity, it actually provides a lot of things, to, questions and things to play around. So that was that was sort of like the, the really good news of DC resistivity. And clearly, it's very effective under certain circumstances. But at some point, you know, it, it's got it's got some problems. So now, what we want to do is we want to go to the next part here, which is electromagnetic induction (EM fundamentals), and we want to sort of see how we could potentially use this other kind of survey to uh, probe subsurface. Did you have a question? Yes, no, just one question uh, uh, about this method, this resistivity method. Yeah. Uh, probably depends on the, on the currents and et cetera, but uh, what is the average depth of penetration of currents? Well, that, how, how deep can we, can we see? Well, that depends upon you know, you come back to the length of the electrode, right? So if you've got an A, B electrode spacing of 10 meters, you're probably going to see three meters depth. If it's, you know, 500 meters, you're going to see about third of that. The, the current as well. Pardon me? The current you are able to inject. So. Intensity of the current. Right. Yeah. So at, at some point, you you need to have bigger currents to to see anything. 
We actually did an experiment, or I was involved in an experiment in South Africa when they put in that first one of their big DC resistivity lines for power transmission. And the, uh, the, the Geophysical Society for, uh, uh, for South Africa kind of got together and they said, well, could we possibly use that as an, as an experiment? So we have, here's the ground, here's, here's your tower, and here's your insulators on the tower. Talk about that in a second. And then you got, you know, power lines that, 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 that join, and then you go on. So now their idea was, so they got this whole line of uh, transmission towers. But this line of transmission towers, uh, it wasn't really in use. They were just starting to put it into, into productivity. And so the geophysicists got on and said, well, look, could we possibly use this as a, uh, to do an, uh, an elect a DC resistivity experiment? And the idea was that at each tower, you could put in a current. So you could put in a plus current here and a minus current in, in, in here. And then now you've got current that goes through like this, and then you could measure, you know, and 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 so they did a Schlumberger survey where this is kind of small compared to that. And then because they've got this power grid, you know, they could just keep keep, keep going, and they could do it, you know, as long as for as big a width as as the power lines. The thing that makes this really interesting is that the distance. The distance between the first power power line, okay, where they had it, and here was greater than a thousand kilometers. Okay, so it's big. You talk about power; they're putting in serious amount of power yes. in this, right? It's dangerous. <laughs> Is, yeah, it's dangerous. I think it's dangerous. Yeah, and then you. Just to give you some sense of scale, if you ever see a picture, so th this is the tower, which is really big. These are just the insulators on it. And if there's a guy standing, and I have, I do have a picture of Johan de Beer standing on one of these power lines. And here's, he's about one third as high, maybe even less, as the whole insulator. So that's just, that's just the insulator, right? <laughs> and you got a man who's standing on there. He's like a third the height. And the whole thing is like more than a thousand kilometers long. And we're able to put enough current in that we got um, an electrical resistivity that's down to about 200 kilometers. The great thing about geophysics, in fact, for all this, is that everything is scalable. Like you could work at a DC survey that's really you know, centimeters in, in size. And you could work at, at, you know, hundreds of kilometers. And the physics is the same. Everything is, is, is the same. You have to worry about noise. You have to worry about how much current you can put in, what kind of voltage you can do. But everything else is the same, which is actually what makes geophysics, and in particular electromagnetic geophysics, so wonderful. Because you work at it in one context, but then you change the scale, but nothing. Nothing really changed. So I want to address this issue of uh, shielding by the uh, by that resistor. So how many? So if I talk, if I mentioned Faraday's law, how many people would know what Faraday's law is? Okay. Kind of late in the afternoon. But. So I want you to take everything that we've just done and just set it over here, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to come back to it. It's going to be really important, but we don't need any of that now. 
we just like, okay, we, we, we've got that. So now let's look at some motivations where it's really difficult to apply DC resistivity. If you think about it, here's one. Okay, so we've got large areas. So maybe it's like 100 kilometers across, right? I mean, the thought of putting in a whole bunch of electrodes and uh, you just don't want to think about it. We had this resistive layer, we already saw that. And we got maybe rugged terrain or places that are really hard to inject. I mean, if you're in Brazil, I mean, especially if you're on land, I mean, there's got to be all kinds of places you just simply can't get into. You've got jungle. I mean, how do you drag wires through? I mean, it's just, you just don't want to go there, right? So we need something else. That something else is going to be electromagnetics. And I, I want to start off by looking at Ampere's law and Faraday's law. We've got a couple of little apps that you could use, and maybe you could use them tonight. And then some kind of a circuit model for electromagnetics, and we'll gradually get through and look at uh, <coughs> surveys that involve sort of inductive sources, and we can put them in, in the air. So here's the basic idea. Here's, here's a helicopter. It's towing uh, a, a, what we call a bird. And on that bird, there is a transmitter, okay, which we'll put in here, and a receiver. Which will How big is it? This particular one might be 10 meters. But they come in all sizes and descriptions. And they and sometimes we can have an airplane here and we could string wires around the outside. There's a whole bunch of ways that, that we can do it. But the basic idea is that we have uh, some kind of a transmitter that's, uh, well, generally it's in the air, but we could put that transmitter on the ground. The important thing is that it's a loop of, of wire. There's no contact with the ground. So we have a transmitter, group of wire, okay, and that's going to produce a primary electric or magnetic field. So it's going to give a magnetic field that kind of looks like that. And if there's a time varying magnetic field, so if the current is changing as a function of time, then we have a time varying magnetic field that's going to induce currents mm -hmm. in any kind of a conductor. And those currents are going to generate a secondary magnetic field that we'll see at the receiver. So that's basically the steps. We've got some kind of a transmitter produces a time-bearing magnetic field that induces currents in a conductor. Those currents give rise to fields. Okay. So what I now want to do, we're going to kind of go through these steps. Uh, in, in a very simple fashion and see how it works. So let's look all first at the transmitter. So the transmitter uh, is just a loop of wire and it's got a current that goes in and we can have different waveforms in the current. It could be something that looks like this or it might be on for a while and you turn it off and then on and the other polarity. So it might look like that or it could just be harmonic. <laughs> Our equations, our Maxwell's equations, we're just going to get rid of one term, which is called the displacement current term. And we're then going to work with all of the rest of these equations. And the important, there's two laws here. One is Faraday's law, which says if I've got a time-bearing magnetic field, I get an electric field. And the other is Ampere's law, which says if I have a current, then I get a magnetic field. So we're going to look at those two things. And then we've got this constitutive relationship here that if we have an electric field of conductivity, I get a curve. So let's, let's, let's break this down. So let's look first of all at Ampere's law that says that if I have a current, then that gives rise to a curl of a magnetic field. So I think everybody is, is kind of used to that like someplace in grade school you had a had a wire you put a current in it and then you had a compass 
and you put the compass up to that, yeah. and you found that oh, that compass needle orients itself in a direction so that the magnetic field is kind of circular. And you had that right hand rule that thumb goes in the direction of the current, and how your fingers curl around tells you how the magnetic. So that's so that's a wire. If I take a wire and I roll it in on itself, and now I got a loop. So locally, in, in a small sense, you know, each of these is it's kind of like a right hand rule, so you can sort of see how that's working, but that's going to be you know, all the way around the whole loop. And at the end, I've got a magnetic field that looks looks like that. In fact, that's the same magnetic field that you have if you had a little dipole magnet. If you had a little magnet, right? so if this was a magnet, and you look at this, and the magnetic field would kind of come out like this. Is this exactly that happens in the Earth's core? Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the Earth's core, there's a lot of currents that are that are going around. It's actually pretty. It's, it's pretty complicated. Magnetic field inside is complicated. As we get farther away, then the terms that we tend to see are just the dipole yes. term. So to first order at the surface of the Earth, yes. it's kind of like a dipole. Yes. So the, the the formula for what that magnetic field is is, is given by this. And it, there's a couple. There's two things here that are important. First is there's m. That's the magnetic moment, okay? And that is equal to the product of the current and the area. That's M. And then the other thing is that it falls off as 1 over R cubed. So those are the two really important things that we always want to remember. Uh, now let's look at Faraday's law. So Faraday's law says that if I've got a time varying magnetic flux, then that's related to the curl of an electric field. So it gives rise to an electric field that's kind of circular. And then we have Ohm's law that if we have an electric field and a conductor, then I must have a current. So the idea here is that this time varying magnetic field that impinges on here gives rise to electric fields and currents in here that are then kind of circular in nature. So just to illustrate this, there's kind of like a simple circuit model. We can, we can take a look at this. So this is a this is a circuit. Here's a here's a coil. And on that coil there is a light bulb as well as a voltmeter. And we can it's 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 a circuit. So we can have a a magnet sitting right there. Uh, and as it's sitting right there, there's, you know, it's everything is uh, it, it's a steady state. There is a magnetic field that comes out come by convention. The magnetic field exits the North Pole and goes into the, the South. So let's just look at this and define a couple of things that are important. The first is something called the magnetic flux. Technically, B is a magnetic flux density. So it's Weber per meter squared. If we integrate that over an area of some sort, then we get what's called the magnetic flux. So we'll call it phi by sub B. Remember the relationship between the between the flux and the electric field is it was the time variation. Okay. So with respect to our, our circuit, the induced voltage in the circuit or the induced EMF, the electromotive force, is actually equal to minus dB dt. D5 dt. And in this case, if the magnet is simply sitting there, Nothing's changing. So there's no time variation. So the magnet's there. There is a magnetic field that's going through there, but there's no voltage. There's no voltage that's that's recorded, and there's no current that's that's going in that circuit. Okay. 
However, I could now take this magnet and I could move it. Okay, so I could push it in. The strength of the magnetic field is larger as it's closer to the north pole. And so the magnetic flux density is going to increase in this coil the moment I push it in. So what's going to happen? I push the magnet in, the magnetic flux increases, but the change in so the magnet the change in the magnetic flux is actually positive, but I've got this negative sign out here. So that means that the voltage is actually less than zero. And that means that there's a specific relationship for which way the current is flowing in the circuit. So in this particular case, then the current is flowing in this clockwise manner. Current is negative. If I then reverse the operation, I pull the magnet out. Now the flux is going to decrease. The time rate of change is increasing because of this. Or the voltage is increasing now because of this negative sign. And the current is, is positive, so it's going around the other direction. So that's the that's the procedure. So if I if I use Sergio again as a uh, like if you imagine you're a, a coil, a wire, or, or something like this, if I if I have a magnet and I push it towards you, then there's a voltage that is, is in you, and it's going to set up a current, and that current is actually going to flow counterclockwise, so that if I look at the magnetic field that's associated with that current, it opposes any change. So the induced current flows in such a way as to oppose the change in the magnetic flux. So that's the ticket, and this is why this minus sign was is actually so important. The, the Earth kind of likes to have, or, or physical systems like to have a, a constant magnetic field. If you change something, there's going to be currents that are induced that are going to oppose the change. So they, they're trying to stay steady. That's the Lenz law that we call it. That's Lenz's law, yeah. yeah. So that's a really important thing. And we're going to kind of need that time and time again because we're always going to be interested in like, okay, I'm doing something. Which, which way are the currents going? Are they going this way? Are they going that way? And you kind of need to have this thing really well in hand. So there's, uh, we, have, we have some apps. There's, for, for Faraday's law, uh, we've got both a frequency domain app and a time domain app. And the way it's going to, to work is that we've got uh, a primary field that is going to be uh, generated with a, a current, you know, a current flowing in a loop. And then there's going to be effectively another loop here, which is going to be our target body. And we're going to look to see what kinds of currents are, 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 are we going to induce in that. So imagine a, a two coil system that looks, I suppose it looked like this. And the outer coil is our source, it's our transmitter. So it's got a magnetic field that's going to be coming down like this, right? So circular move gives rise to a magnetic, magnetic field. So the primary field is going to be vertically down at the center. And if we had a, you know, a target in here, there'd be a flux that's coming down through that, and that's going to induce currents in this target. This target is going to be characterized by two, two circuit values. It's resistance and it's self-inductance is L. How many, how, how many people done circuit, uh, you know, circuit modeling so that you know what uh, you know, self-inductance is or resistance or capacitance? Everybody? Nobody? Yeah. A long time ago. A long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. Okay. Oh, is it? I don't know. 
They might be dead because it's on. Okay. Yeah, I think it's it's just dead. Maybe let me let me take you through the 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 time domain app or the, the result first, and then I'll I'll go to the to, to the app. Um, so here it is. We've got an outer loop here, which is that's sort of our, our, our primary, or generate the primary field, and then we've got our inner loop here, which is the target. So the primary current is going to be on, and then we're going to we're going to turn it off. So it's like we've got a constant current going in this loop, and then we're going to switch it off. The moment that I I switch it off, I'm going to have a strong change in the magnetic flux as it goes through this inner loop. And that is going to induce currents in, in this loop that are actually then going to decay with time. And the secondary currents in here follow this kind of a law. So initially when I turn it off, there's a secondary current in the loop. And then it decays as t over tau. Tau is a time constant and is equal to L self conductance is that better? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so if we looked at the uh, secondary currents in this loop, yeah, they're going to start off at some value is and then decay away exp exponentially. The quantity that was really of interest is something called the response function. And that is really characteristic of, okay, how fast are these currents uh, d decaying? And in this case, the response function is just that e to the minus t of, upon tau. And if we plot it in a kind of a linear, linear format, it sort of looks like this. So these, these are just e to the minus t upon taus with different taus uh, you know, spanning an order of magnitude. If I plot it in a log time, okay, if I take the log of that, I just now get straight lines. So it's going to look like this. So a steep line here, the red, is a really short time constant, and a shallow line is a really long time constant. And remember, the time constant depends upon L upon R. So, This is a really nice app. There's a lot of, again, a lot of really fundamental things that uh, that, that you can see with this. So here's the uh, here's the parameters. We have the the current in the uh, in the primary circuit. So it's a sub p. So in this case, uh, that's this one here. And then we have a radius of that, so we can make it bigger or, or, or smaller. 
we have another loop here. That's our target, and we can we can put it in various places. So the uh, the target loop has got a radius A and a horizontal position X and a Z position Z. So we can move that move that around, and then we can also tilt the uh, tilt the target. So we'll be able to see how that change in flux actually uh, affects things. And then the target itself is characterized by a, a resistance and a self-inductance. Uh, right. Okay. Um, so that's uh, that, that's what we have. And then there's you know information about what the uh, response should should be. And here's just an equation for what the response is, it, it depends upon the areas of the loops and various things, but also importantly, this quantity here, uh, this exponential. So let's just look at this example. So here, for instance, we've got a, a primary transmitter here and now we've got a receiver loop that's down there or that's that's our target and then the question is what do we what do we obtain if we take and we look at the response of this thing as a function of, of time so the times that we're talking about here are, are now pretty short so notice this is 10 to the minus 5 so that's like 10 microseconds we're going to see those kinds of times a lot uh, geophysical work for airborne studies, typical time scales are you know like a microsecond or ten microseconds out to a millisecond. So those are the, those are the, the time scales that we're we're talking about with, with this. And we notice that if we turn this off, and initially uh, the magnetic field, this this response that we have is at some, some constant value and then it decays away with a particular time scale that's actually dependent upon the uh, parameters of the, of the model. So in here, we've got the resistance as 100. So these are logarithmic values. L, self-inductance, as 0 0.01. And so there's four orders of magnitude, so the, the relation, the ratio of R to L, in this case, is 10 to the 4. Uh, if we look at a time scale of reciprocal of that, 10 to the minus 4, you can see like, okay, here's, here's, here's where I'm at. So the, at a time of uh, 10 to the minus 4 seconds or a tenth of a millisecond, you can see that we're kind of really in the heart of the, the, the decay of this. So that's, uh, that's, that's great. So this time scale that we're talking about is really related to you know, how fast things are, are decaying. Um. Yeah, so maybe the other thing that's of interest here <clears throat> is to look at the effects of like what happens if I what happens if I change the orientation of this of this loop. Okay. So remember <clears throat> the current in the loop was proportional to the time rate of change of flux, right? So if I change the flux, then I'm I'm going to reduce the amount of current that's that's induced. So I'm going to take this response or this target coil and I'm going to change it, change its orientation by changing this quantity here, the, the theta quantity. So theta, theta is this angle that's, that, that's in here. So if theta is uh, equal to equal to zero, it's sort of it's, it's horizontal, theta is equal to 90, it will be perpendicular. So let's just change that. Okay. 
So what I want you to do is to, you kind of need to watch what's happening over here. There's a couple of things. There's the shape of the curve, but there's also the amplitude. So right now we're at about two times 10 to the minus four. Okay, so that's, that's our strongest signal. Now I'm gonna change that orientation. So if I make it 20 degrees, yeah, hasn't hasn't really changed that much. Right? So you know, like 20 degrees. So I've got a I've got a loop like this. I change it to like 20 degrees. You know, not not so much has changed. But if I change it up to let's say 50 degrees, so it's now looking looking like this. So now you can see the response is like 1.5. So I reduced the response by 30%. So now you can start to understand like how is that? Well, it's because, I mean, if you look at the, at the normal component of the flux, remember it's sort of B dot N hat, right? So the normal is like this way. And so if you just look at the normal component of the flux going through, you've actually got kind of like a reduced area. So you have a reduced flux. And now the more I tilt that loop up, I make it 70. So now you're at like 0.8. So you notice the character of the curve doesn't change. The character of the curve depends upon R and L, okay? But the, uh, the strength is, is, is changing. So now we're at eight times ten minus five, and if I continue on with that, about eighty or ninety. So if I do ninety, so if the coil is like that, I don't have anything. This this turns out to be important. We'll see this this again. So. I now get no induced currents in here because there's no flux that's going through that coil. None. And you know, I still get the same shape, but look, those numbers are 10 to minus 20. There's, 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 there's nothing, it's, it's zero. Okay. One more thing. Okay, so that's what happens in the time domain. Uh, we can work in the time domain. In fact, working in the time domain is intuitively easier to is uh, easy to understand. Uh, but we could also work in the frequency domain where the transmitter is continually on. So I want to first of all show you what happens there. So now we're going to look at this kind of a system. So we've seen what happens when we have a transient pulse. But, so what happens if we have a harmonic pulse that looks like this? So the transient was easy, right? So we, we, we've got a flux, okay? And now we turn this thing off and we can see everything decay. But there's a real big difference here. I mean, certainly things are changing because the amplitude of the flux is changing. But there's always a driving force. And sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative, And we need to contend with, with, with that. So we have the, another app. This looks like uh, it's, it's going to be a, a frequency domain app. And I, I want to walk you through a slide before we actually go, go through it. So here's the slide. If we have two coils that, that look like this, so we've got a primary, a primary field. So let's suppose that the primary is, is sinusoidal. It varies as cosine omega t. Okay? So here's the primary. So it's going to induce a current in the target coil, and it's going to be varying. But how can it how can it vary? It's, it still has to be cosine omega t. You just can't can't get rid of it. 
So that current in the coil in here is a cosine omega t, okay? But maybe it could be phase shifted a bit. So it could be phase shifted by an amount of psi. And then we've got a, a, an amplitude. Okay, so this this has got to be a mathematical description of what is is there. Are, are primary fields cosine? You know, are currents in our uh, carpet also have to be cosine? The only thing can happen is you know change the amplitude or change the phase or both. Look at look at this uh, expression here: cosine omega t minus epsi. If you remember that you can decompose the, uh, the, the difference of two arguments in a cosine like this. So I can write this quantity here as a cosine of psi times uh, cosine omega t plus something times a sine omega, omega t. Okay, so that's great. What does all that, that mean? First of all, I got two parts. One of them is is a cosine, so that's the same as the primary, right? So the primary is like cosine omega t, and this part here is also varying as omega t, and so we're going to say uh, this part is in phase with the primary, and sometimes it's called real. This part is varying as sine of omega t, and you know, so its amplitude, so the so the cosine is like this, and the sine is like this, right? So it's it's out of phase. So we sometimes refer to that as the out of phase part, auditory part, and for mathematical reasons, we sometimes call it the imaginary part. So the, the, the point is that the secondary signal that we have, so here's the primary, is in the red. The secondary is, is green, and you can see it's still got the same harmonic uh, dependence, got a different amplitude, and the peaks are shifted a bit. So the peaks are shifted by an amount of, of psi. And now we can take that green curve and decompose it into one that looks like this. So that's just the in-phase part of one that looks like this, which is the out-of-phase or quadrature part. Perhaps the thing that is the most mystifying to non-electromagnetic people when they're talking to EM people, and we should not be doing this at 4 30 in the afternoon, uh, is this whole business, you know, the EM people are like, oh well that's the real part, that's the imaginary part, that's the in phase, that's the quadrature, right? You know, and after a while, you know, people are like, what are you talking about? Like imaginary data. I remember when the C4 EM stuff came on. I was it was sort of at the first year at the SEG. And there was all these people going around talking about you know the imaginary you know the, you know, the imaginary component of the C4 EM data, and you see all these size models. Like, what? Yeah, you know, like what do you mean imaginary? What, what kind of data are you, right? Uh, so it caused great causes great confusion, but it's, it should not cause confusion because all that we're all you have to do is remember this diagram. Here's a primary, here's a secondary. We can decompose this secondary into something that is in phase with this red curve and something that's 90 degrees out of phase. That's it. It's as simple as that, but can cause, can cause confusion. We also have an expression for how much this phase lag is of psi, and it's given by this, pi over 2, and then arctan of omega L upon R. So remember that was related to tau, the decay cost. So L upon R is a, is a crucial thing. And this quantity here is actually called the induction number. So we can plot this. So if we have on this axis here the induction number, which is omega L upon R, and here's the response. So back here we have a, an in phase and a, a quadrature phase, right? So now we're actually going to plot that 
in, in, in here. So the in-phase part starts at zero and it kind of goes up and then it stays up just like that. And the quadrature phase is the dashed line. Okay, so there's the in-phase and the out-of-phase component as a function of the response function and induction number. This is a diagram also that we will see a lot. And this is probably like a really good place to leave things because then you're going to remember this when you're sleeping at night. So we we'll see this guy here. So I just want to show you the app and then you can even play with it tonight and we'll pick it up again tomorrow morning. So this is now the RL circuit harmonic. So basically everything is the same. Nothing has changed. So the, the geometries are the same. So all the parameters here are exactly what we had, had, had before. It's just that the response function is now no longer just a you know, time. Response function for the time domain, remember this was time and this was the response. For the frequency domain data, we've always got two numbers because we've got sort of an in phase and an out of phase part. And so our response function is the in phase and here is the, the, the out of phase. So we can actually play around with, uh, play around with that to see you know, how are things going to change. Uh, well, so for instance, for here, just it's a little bit smaller. So in this particular case, uh, we've got a harmonic current coming in here. The primary field is in black. The secondary field is, is in green. And if we decompose this secondary field into like an in phase, which is the blue, and a quadrature phase, which is red, they, they come out looking like, like this. The, there's a relative amplitude here. You see that the, the quadrature phase is actually a little bit, the red's a little bit bigger than the blue, okay? If we look at our response curve, and we're at this frequency of 10 to the fifth hertz, you notice that the, it cuts the solid line at a lower amplitude than the dashed line. So from the response curve at this particular frequency, the quadrature part is larger than the real. And that's what we see here. The, uh, the red is actually larger than the blue. So here's where the response curve is, is really important because it tells us the relative uh, magnitude of the uh, real and the, the in-phase and the out-of-phase components. If we're at this particular frequency, at 10 to 5th hertz, the quadrature is bigger. If we change the frequency, so if I make the frequency less, If I make the frequency less, now we're sitting up over here, the real part's almost zero, and the only thing that's left is the imaginary or quadrature phase. But if I now go to a region that's higher frequency, <coughs> I'm sitting up. If I'm sitting way up over, over here, whoopsie, went too far. Okay, so if I'm if, if I'm sitting up over here at this at this particular frequency, then I would expect most of my signal is coming into the real part, and smaller amounts coming into the into the quadrature part. So 
here, here, here it is in, in kind of a, of, of a nutshell, okay? I'm putting a, a sinusoidal uh, magnetic field on Sergio. There's going to be currents that are kind of going in and in. The uh, relative amount of those currents, so those currents can be broken up into an in phase and an out of phase component, right? So we're, every current is kind of going to be partitioned into an in phase and an out of phase. Now the question is, who's, who's bigger? Well, that depends on the response function, and that in turn depends upon the frequency. If I'm at a really low frequency, it turns out that most of the uh, most of the uh, the currents are in the quadrature phase. In other words, they're only of 90 degrees. If I have very high frequencies, most of the data are in the in phase part or the real part. So it's it's that partitioning that is, is the difference. When you see any EM data that coming, that's provided by anybody, they're probably going to present it as an in-phase and an out-of-phase part. So you're gonna get two maps because you've got a complex number. So you have to have, you have, to have an amplitude in a phase or a real and imaginary part. That's it, you, you have to have that. And all that it means with this real and imaginary part is just like how much is partitioned in parts that's kind of in phase and how much is out of phase. And when I start, okay, at a really low frequency, those currents are going to be almost 90 degrees out of phase, right? They're all in the quadrature. And as I jack up the frequency, maybe faster, 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 then eventually they're actually going to be in the real part. They're going to be actually 180 degrees out of this line of sun. So that's all that happens. It's not complicated, but you, you have to understand what those things are. Yes. So I have to put so here the frequency. Which pre, which, what is the frequency? Like uh, which frequency you mean? Like you have this omega, which is your input signal frequency. No, this the, the frequency that I've got here. So f, so this one is at f is ten to the sixth in, in this particular. So in your equator, which frequency is in the in the equator that you show there? Um, yeah, all the two pi f to two pi times ten to the sixth. I, I just left it as o, omega is or just okay. two pi linear frequency. And then what we're seeing here is this is what happens at a linear frequency of ten to the sixth. For this particular, I, if I change, if I change my target, let's suppose I make my target uh, less resistive. Okay, if I make it less resistive, that's gonna we're we're like that. Or if I make it more resistive, then it then, then it looks like that. So at, at ten to the sixth hertz, okay. It's almost all in the quadrature, and if I look in here, you can see that the red is hugely bigger than the yeah. So you said when they report their EM recording, you have either report both their real part and their imaginary part, or you report their, um, like the face and their and the amplitude. amplitude. So here, the amplitude means their IS times um, cosine uh, shit. Right. So, so, so the, the, the amplitude is the square root of the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared. Oh, right. So it's, it's just it's a complex number, right? So I can look at the real and the imaginary, or if I look at an amplitude, then I sum the squares and take squares. So basically, it's IS. Yes. Yes. The amplitude would be I. Uh, no. Uh, the, I. It would be no. It's because the amplitude is going to change with frequency. So if we look at these numbers here, okay, the primary current is goes from one to minus one. The amplitude of the secondary current looks. Look, looks like this. Okay, if I change, where do I go? Uh, 
I'm not. So if I, which I'm making it more resistive. Oops. Here. So if I'm if I'm sitting up here now, that amplitude has, has changed. So the amplitude that you'd get is the sum of squares of this number plus uh, <coughs> plus this number, and then square rooted. The phase is going to be the difference between this guy here and this guy here. So there's a phase of 122 degrees in, in here, big flag. And the amplitude that you'd get is given by this amplitude here, right? So it'd be a 0.04. But if I change, if I change any of the parameters, or if I change the uh, fr frequency, so if that's point, let's just look at this guy. So it's 0.03 or something. If I now. Uh, uh. Oh, I'm not sure. I, I just kind of lost. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So in the, in the green... If you look at the bottom of that top plot, it shows you the maximum angle. See that there? Yeah, so here. Yeah. So it's 1.4 times 10 to the minus. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then so if you, so even if looking at the frequency response curve, you can see that both of those numbers are, are pretty small right now. Like the contribution, so if we look at this plot here, the contribution of coming from each of those is pretty small. But if you up the frequency a little bit. Can you go back to the slide? Because, um, kind of, because you changed those variables here. So if you look at the slides, look at the equation, I try to understand what is the amplitude and what is the frequency of one. One just quick thing before he goes back to the slides, because just now that he's increased the frequency, you can see here we've moved up on both of those curves. Uh, and so, so here the amplitude has So here increased. the frequency means omega in the equation? means f. But omega is just 2 pi times f. So okay. it's just okay. a factor of 2 so, pi. Okay. So it's but, but why is changing? I mean, it should be given if, if that's your input frequency, right? So why is changing? Like if you have like uh, um, sine, like a harmonic kind of wave, yeah. so it should be a, at a fixed frequency. Right. So why you have, why you have range Oh, because we're doing that experiment at many different frequencies. We're just showing you, okay, if you were at 10 hertz, this is what you get. If you were at 100 hertz, this is what you get. And so that's that's why this guy is going. But at each individual frequency, then you've got a particular ratio of like the in phase. Uh, and then you have that phase lag. So when you say, when you record the amplitude and the frequency, so you, that kind of phase. So does that face refers to your face lag or your face yep. lag? Yeah, this is this is this so you see the peak here and then the peak here. So there's a there's a difference. Oh. There's a difference there. So that's your phase lag, and then you've got an amplitude that's associated with this with with, with the grade. This phase angle is the angle between the real and the imaginary part. Uh, uh, no, it's between primary and secondary. But isn't, isn't it like the Hilbert transform analysis? But the well, it, it, uh, our, our can real, yeah. our can imaginary over real would give you, yeah. would give you space. Our can is at the handle itself. Yeah, and our can. Yes. So, so then that lag shouldn't be a, shouldn't be a function of time. It's a, just the one number. It's just one. If you have like your resistance or 
uh, your induction number and your input input frequency. If all those are fixed, then your um, phase lag should be a given. Single number. number. Yeah. Higher twenty degrees. Like, and it should always be ninety degrees on my. That's correct. Okay, well, this is probably a pretty good place to, you can, what I encourage you to do, actually, this would be great if, you know, tonight or, you know, you just download a couple of these apps, in particular, these two that are associated with the, um, with the circuit model, and just kind of try to get familiar with what we consider the, the response function both in the time and in the frequency and see what that what that how that resonates with these plots and then we'll pick this up tomorrow morning because th this stuff is really crucial you get this and then, then suddenly everything else is is easy but if you don't get this then everything else is always confusing so it's it's kind of important to get these these sort of fundamentals and so down, well, download, sign on and uh, you know, try out those two apps. That'll give you practice in, in working with the apps. And then bring some questions, and then we'll go over what we just talked about today, first thing tomorrow. And then your other homework assignment is to find out what National Tequila Day means, because that's, that's actually even more important. <laughs> Okay, Chris, yeah, that's, that's a personal assignment then for you. Oh, yeah, don't worry. Okay, thanks, guys. Thank you.